apologize that we're running a few minutes late getting started this afternoon. We had some difficulty getting the, uh, the Wi-Fi or the Facebook or something, but we finally got everything to load. At least, I very much hope that you're seeing and hearing us at this point. We begin as we live, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And together we pray the Collect for Peace. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. Sit over here. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And tonight we begin to study what the Catechism teaches regarding the sacrament of holy baptism. And she is really trying to get comfortable here so she can sleep as she normally does. And so as we begin looking at this precious sacrament, holy baptism, what we find is that Luther, and for whatever reason, what I printed did not save. I apologize uh, for that. I had everything set up. Um, it's not been an easy day. So give me just one second to reach behind me for the catechism. Here we are. And we will look it up. I guess I didn't wait for this computer here to synchronize with what I did on the computer at home. And so consequently, we are not on the same page. So here we are. Fortunately, we have a copy of Luther's Small Catechism, and we are able to look up where we need to be. And yes, this is a little on the embarrassing side. Daily prayers. A lot of good things in here. Okay, there's the Lord's Prayer. Finally, we are at the Sacrament of Holy Baptism. Luther asks the question, What is baptism? He answers, Baptism is not plain water, but it is the water included in God's command and combined with God's word. And so Luther wants, from the outset, to make sure everybody understands we're not saying this is magical water. He says it's not just plain water, but it is water included in the command and connected to the Word of God. He says, since he said this is found in the Word of God and it's joined to the Word of God, he naturally asks the question, what is this Word of God? Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, and that's Matthew 28, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, verse 19. For a sacrament to be a sacrament, or I might better say a sacred rite in the church to be a sacrament, it must, it must meet three criterion. In the first place, it must be commanded by our Lord Jesus Christ. In the second, it must have an earthly element, some stuff with it, something that can be seen, tasted, touched, smelled, etc. And finally, number three, it must bring with it the forgiveness of sins. And so when we look in our church teaching, we only have two sacraments. But we have 
as sacred rights, important rights within the church, other things that are considered as sacraments by some other denominations. For example, in the Roman Catholic Church, when one is confirmed, that is a sacrament. But in the Lutheran tradition, it is not. We practice confirmation. My catechism students who dutifully come out twice a month and are working hard in learning the scriptures and the small catechism would be most concerned that they're putting in three years and there's no such thing as confirmation. Of course, we celebrate the rite of confirmation, but it's not commanded by Christ. It doesn't have an earthly element, unless you want to include the confirmand, and it doesn't bring with it the forgiveness of sins. But that instead, what confirmation does is it affirms the baptismal promises made on the person's behalf. Most times as babies or small children, parents and sponsors made promises that they would bring them to the services of God's house, that they would provide for their instruction in the Christian faith, teach them the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, the Creed. And so that on the day that one is confirmed, they confess their faith in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and pledge that they will continue in this faith even unto death, should it come to that, rather than deny their Lord Jesus Christ. Marriage in the Roman Catholic Church is seen as a sacrament. Not seen as a sacrament, but it is observed as a sacrament. Where in our tradition, we of course celebrate holy matrimony as a sacred rite, but not as a sacrament. Because, again, it's not commanded specifically by Christ. Although, when we look at what he says in Mark, he quotes from Genesis 2. He says that, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Genesis 2, 24. Uh, certainly God has commanded marriage for couples. It doesn't bring with it the forgiveness of sins. Although there is forgiveness within marriage of one another, and of course husband and wife are receiving God's forgiveness, but it doesn't happen through that. And I'm not going to go through all of them. You're probably terribly bored already. But for us, a sacrament has three criteria. Must be commanded by our Lord Jesus Christ. It must have an earthly element. And it must bring with it the forgiveness of sins. And so our sacraments are holy baptism and the Lord's Supper. In holy baptism, our Lord Jesus Christ, as we just read here from the Catechism, but of course it's from the Bible, Matthew 28, 19, Jesus says, and this is when he is appearing to his disciples after his resurrection up on the mountain in Galilee. He says to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. That's a command. He says, go therefore and make disciples. How do you do it? Baptizing in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. The earthly element is the water. Water that can be touched, smelled. Doesn't give off much of an aroma, because it's water. It can be tasted. It can be seen. And as we pour it into the baptismal font from the pitcher or the ewer, E-W-E-R, fancy name for a pitcher that we use in church, as it's poured in and you hear it splashing in the basin, it can be heard. And finally, our Lord promises, as we see through Paul's writing to the Romans in chapter 6, for if we have been united to Christ's death in a baptism, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. And we have the promise that in this sacrament, we receive the forgiveness of all sins and eternal life and salvation for Christ's sake. 
I don't want to go too far in talking about the Lord's Supper because that we will deal with a little bit later on in our, in our course. But certainly when you look at the Lord's Supper, we read in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as well as in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, here's the command, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. What's he say? Do this in remembrance of me. It's not a suggestion. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take, drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do, there's the command, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The earthly elements, bread and wine, tasted, they can be touched, they can be smelled, they can be seen. If they're really dry, the bread, you can hear it. And certainly you can hear the wine being poured into the chalice. And we hear Jesus say, This is my body, which is given for you for the forgiveness of sins. This is my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And so there we have the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, the earthly element, something that can be seen, touched, tasted, felt. And we have it bringing with it the forgiveness of all of our sins. And so Luther, he asks the question, he says, what is baptism? And his answer, very important, his answer. He says, baptism is not just plain water, but it is the water included in God's command and combined with God's word. As we read in Matthew chapter 28, 19. Luther asks the next question, and we'll close with this. Luther says, well, what benefits does baptism give? It works forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this, as the words and promises of God declare. And so everyone who takes into their heart by the working of the Holy Spirit, I, that was a very awkward way to say that because I got confused between baptism and the Lord's Supper. That's how I got into the language of take. But whoever receives this sacrament of holy baptism in which the Holy Spirit, working through God's word combined with the water, that he forgives our sins. He comes to dwell within us, this Holy Spirit. He makes us sons and daughters of Christ, or I'm sorry, of the Father. It's been a long day. Sons and daughters of the Father by adoption. In this baptism, we are adopted as the Father's daughters and sons, made sisters and brothers with Christ himself, and inheritors of everything that rightfully belongs to Christ as he inherits from his Father meaning the kingdom of heaven and eternal life. All these things are given through this wonderful gift of holy baptism. Now, of course, Luther is going to say, well, what is this word of God? Because for everyone who believes, as the words and promises of God declare. So Luther says, well, which are these words and promises of God? Luther says, quoting the Bible, Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Mark, we're in chapter 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16, verse 16. 
it's very important, and I know you didn't come here for an English lesson. You might be asking yourself at this point, why did I come here? But you're here now, so please stay. But when we look at this verse, Mark 16, 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. With my catechism students, we, we diagram this sentence, which is something that they do in English classes, although they're dealing with subject and predicate. But we look at the sentence. We look at the sentence, and we divide it into two clauses, two parts. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, part one. But whoever does not believe will be condemned, part two. And I say to them, other than one being positive and one being negative, one being salvation and the other being damnation, what do you notice that's different about these two clauses? And we, you know, mark them out and underline them and that kind of thing. And very quickly, someone in the class will say, there's two things going on in the first part, but only one going on in the second clause or the second part of this verse. And they're exactly right. What are the conditions upon which one will be saved? Whoever believes and is baptized. What is the condition upon which Jesus says one will be condemned? Whoever does not believe. Why do I lift this out? To bore you? <laughs> Maybe. And I know she's falling asleep. That went really well. But so we see the importance of how we understand baptism. You'll notice the absence of the word baptism or baptized in the second part. In the first part, whoever believes and is baptized. In the second part, whoever does not believe. Baptism is missing in the second part. So you cannot say, you cannot say, that not being baptized is a condition for being condemned. Jesus doesn't say that. He speaks about belief. And the lack of belief being the criterion upon which one will be condemned. So what's going on here? Baptism. And she just ran off. It's been a great day. Um, it's going to become called Catechism and Houseplant because I'm just going to bring a plant over here. But at any rate, Jesus, Jesus is saying, whoever believes will be saved. How do they arrive at that belief? It's, it's created by the Holy Spirit through God's Word. Yes, always. In that baptism, in that baptism, they receive salvation. They receive saving faith in Christ Jesus within them. It creates the faith that it requires. As you saw here, Luther reminds us that whoever believes as the words and promises declare, this sacrament of holy baptism creates the faith that is required to believe it. So God is doing all the work. Who will be condemned? Will you be condemned because you're not baptized? No simply on the basis of not believing, one is condemned. And so this gift of baptism is just that. It's a most precious and wonderful gift given to us for the sake of our eternal souls and also for the sake of our lives in the here and now. It is this gift of baptism through which we receive Christ's death in our place. As he dies on the cross, answering for our sins, that it is then appropriated to us. We receive the benefits of his death upon the cross through this sacrament. And that every day, every day, we need to return to this precious gift because we know sin, death, and the devil are always encroaching upon our lives. The devil's influences the temptations of the world and the frailty of our own sinful flesh are always seeking to drag us away from Christ. We return to that baptism. We return to that baptism every time 
we repent, declaring that we have messed up. We have not loved God as we should. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves, as he has commanded. And we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. And then we trust that precious word, that you are forgiven all these things for the sake of Christ, who indeed died in your place and answered for your sins. Many times in our prayer lives and in worship, we make the sign of the Holy Cross. This was received first in holy baptism. We had a wonderful baptism last Sunday. And before the little girl was baptized, I made the sign of the Holy Cross on her forehead and again over her heart, declaring, Receive as you receive this baptismal gift, this precious sacrament. And Luther reminds us that any time that we come into contact with water, including in the morning when we wash our face, Luther says it's a time to remember that we are baptized. Maybe you have been in churches where they have water available in the baptismal font. Uh, the reason that we, we simply don't do this, it's a wonderful practice. I love it very much. We don't have the space to do that in such a way that allows people to come forward for the Lord's Supper who are using walkers and wheelchairs. And, and so we don't want the remembrance of one sacrament to prevent people from having access to the other. And so that's why we don't have this available. But you'll go into churches and you'll see that the baptismal font has water in it. And it's appropriate to take two fingers, dip it in the water, and make the sign of the cross or over yourself. Remembering, as Luther teaches us, I am baptized. I belong to Christ. And through this precious gift of baptism, he belongs to me. In the name of Jesus, amen. And I'll bring her back at the end, because now she's laying on the floor sleeping. Um, but I will bring her back, let her sleep, and we will go through the rest of our time together, beginning with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And we pray the prayer of our congregation. Kind Father, we remember before you all those persons whom we have named on our prayer list, Keith, Bob, Christine, Nora, Amy, Roxanne, Veronica, Wes, Dan, Paula, John, Joe, Dick, Pam, Al, and Jan, Kurt, Ruth, Carol, Jan, Marsha, Bob, Darlene, Carol, Karen, Brad, Keith, John, Bobby, Mike, Tom, Doris, Joaquin, Marcy, Laura Jo, Caden, and all of our members who are homebound, namely Bev, Beverly, Dan, Carol, Donna, Janice, John, Shirley, Roger, Katie, Ione, Christine, and Ed as well as those who serve in the military, particularly Kyle Summers, all emergency services personnel, and all who work for the common good. May they be comforted and cared for, and may your will be done in their lives. In the strong name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And then we pray Luther's evening prayer that he suggests in the small catechism. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. 
For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God, the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless you and keep you. Amen. And give me just a moment. I'll bring our our creature person over here. Which is fairly easy to do when we have treats. Hey, Belle. Ah. Would you like to come over, have a treat? Here, come on. Here you are. We'll have you just come up here for just a second. And you draw your treat. I have another one up here. So we'll just get you a different one. Here we are. And that's falling. That's okay. So here we are. Let's give you a blessing. May Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Got a kiss? Thank you. There you go. Well, we are glad that you are here this night. Uh, sorry about some of our foibles. Uh, next week, I will make sure that the home computer and the office computer synchronize so I print out the correct stuff. And uh, we will try to see if we can keep you on the lap as well. But I hope that you have a very good week ahead. And if I may pray for you, or if you would like to be added to our prayer list, please do not hesitate to let us know, and we will gladly add you either to my prayer list or to the congregations. And uh, you can send me an email or a text, as well as connect with me here on Facebook. And I will give her one more treat so that I can stop the live stream without a dog licking my head. Have a great week.